Death at the Excelsior by P. G. Woodhouse. One. The room was the typical bedroom of the typical boarding house, furnished, in so far as it could be said to be furnished at all, with a severe simplicity. It contained two beds, a pine chest of drawers, a strip of faded carpet, and a wash basin. But there was that on the floor which set this room apart from a thousand rooms of the same kind. Flat on his back, with his hands tightly clenched and one leg twisted oddly under him, and with his teeth gleaming through his gray beard in a horrible grin, Captain John Gunner stared up at the ceiling with eyes that saw nothing. Until a moment before he had had the little room all to himself. But now two people were standing just inside the door looking down at him. One was a large policeman, who twisted his helmet nervously in his hands. The other was a tall, gaunt old woman in a rusty black dress, who gazed with pale eyes at the dead man. Her face was quite expressionless. The woman was Mrs. Pickett, owner of the Excelsior Boarding House. The policeman's name was Grogan. He was a genial giant, a terror to the riotous element of the waterfront, but obviously ill at ease in the presence of death. He drew in his breath, wiped his forehead, and whispered, "'Look at his eyes, ma'am!' Mrs. Pickett had not spoken a word since she had brought the policeman into the room, and she did not do so now. Constable Grogan looked at her quickly. He was afraid of Mother Pickett, as was everybody else along the waterfront. Her silence, her pale eyes, and the quiet decisiveness of her personality cowed even the tough old salts who patronized the Excelsior. She was a formidable influence in that little community of sailormen. "'That's just how I found him,' said Mrs. Pickett. She did not speak loudly, but her voice made the policeman start. He wiped his forehead again. "'It might have been apoplexy,' he hazarded. Mrs. Pickett said nothing. There was a sound of footsteps outside, and a young man entered, carrying a black bag. "'Good morning, Mrs. Pickett. I was told that—' "'Good Lord!' The young doctor dropped to his knees beside the body and raised one of the arms. After a moment he lowered it gently to the floor and shook his head in grim resignation. "'He's been dead for hours,' he announced. "'When did you find him?' Twenty minutes back,' replied the old woman. "'I guess he died last night. He never would be called in the morning. Said he liked to sleep on. Well, he's got his wish.' "'What did he die of, sir?' asked the policeman. "'It's impossible to say without an examination.' the doctor answered. It looks like a stroke, but I'm pretty sure it isn't. It might be a coronary attack, but I happen to know his blood pressure was normal and his heart sound. He called in to see me only a week ago, and I examined him thoroughly. But sometimes you can be deceived. The inquest will tell us. He eyed the body almost resentfully. I can't understand it. The man had no right to drop dead like this. He was a tough old sailor who ought to have been good for another twenty years. If you want my honest opinion, though I can't possibly be certain until after the inquest, I should say he had been poisoned." "'How would he be poisoned?' asked Mrs. Pickett quietly. "'That's more than I can tell you. There's no glass about that he could have drunk it from. He might have got it in capsule form. But why should he have done it?' He was always a pretty cheerful sort of old man, wasn't he?" "'Yes, sir,' said the constable. He had the name of being a joker in these parts. Kind of sarcastic, they tell me, though he never tried it on me." "'He must have died quite early last night,' said the doctor. He turned to Mrs. Pickett. "'What's become of Captain Muller? If he shares this room, he ought to be able to tell us something about it.' Captain Muller spent the night with some friends at Portsmouth said Mrs. Pickett. He left right after supper, and hasn't returned." The doctor stared thoughtfully about the room, frowning. "'I don't like it. I can't understand it. If this had happened in India, I should have said the man had died from some form of snake-bite. I was out there two years, and I've seen a hundred cases of it. 
The poor devils all looked just like this. But the thing's ridiculous. How could a man be bitten by a snake in a Southampton waterfront boarding house? Was the door locked when you found him, Mrs. Pickett? Mrs. Pickett nodded. I opened it with my own key. I had been calling to him and he didn't answer, so I guessed something was wrong. The constable spoke. You ain't touched anything, ma'am. They're always very particular about that. If the doctor's right and there's been anything up, that's the first thing they'll ask. Everything's just as I found it. What's that on the floor beside him? the doctor asked. Only his harmonica. He liked to play it of an evening in his room. I've had some complaints about it from some of the gentlemen, but I never saw any harm, so long as he didn't play it too late. Seems as if he was playing it when it happened, Constable Grogan said. That don't look much like suicide, sir. I didn't say it was suicide. Grogan whistled. You don't think— I'm not thinking anything, until after the inquest. All I say is that it's queer. Another aspect of the matter seemed to strike the policeman. I guess this ain't going to do the Excelsior any good, ma'am, he said sympathetically. Mrs. Pickett shrugged her shoulders. I suppose I had better go and notify the coroner, said the doctor. He went out, and after a momentary pause the policeman followed him. Constable Grogan was not greatly troubled with nerves, but he felt a decided desire to be somewhere where he could not see the dead man's staring eyes. Mrs. Pickett remained where she was, looking down at the still form on the floor. Her face was expressionless, but inwardly she was tormented and alarmed. It was the first time such a thing as this had happened at the Excelsior and, as Constable Grogan had hinted, it was not likely to increase the attractiveness of the house in the eyes of possible boarders. It was not the threatened pecuniary loss which was troubling her. As far as money was concerned, she could have lived comfortably on her savings, for she was richer than most of her friends supposed. It was the blot on the escutcheon of the Excelsior, the stain on its reputation which was tormenting her. The Excelsior was her life. Starting many years before, beyond the memory of the oldest boarder, she had built up the model establishment, the fame of which had been carried to every corner of the world. Men spoke of it as a place where you were fed well, cleanly housed, and where petty robbery was unknown. Such was the chorus of praise that it was not likely that much harm could come to the Excelsior from a single mysterious death but Mother Pickett was not consoling herself with such reflections. She looked at the dead man with pale, grim eyes. Out in the hallway the doctor's voice further increased her despair. He was talking to the police on the telephone, and she could distinctly hear his every word. 2. The offices of Mr. Paul Snyder's detective agency in New Oxford Street had grown in the course of a dozen years from a single room to an impressive suite bright with polished wood, clicking typewriters, and other evidences of success. Where once Mr. Snyder had sat and waited for clients and attended to them himself, he now sat in his private office and directed eight assistants. He had just accepted a case, a case that might be nothing at all or something exceedingly big. It was on the latter possibility that he had gambled. The fee offered was, judged by his present standards of prosperity, small. But the bizarre facts, coupled with something in the personality of the client, had won him over. He briskly touched the bell and requested that Mr. Oakes be sent in to him. Elliot Oakes was a young man who both amused and interested Mr. Snyder for, though he had only recently joined the staff, he made no secret of his intention of revolutionizing the methods of the agency. Mr. Snyder himself, in common with most of his assistants, relied for results on hard work and plenty of common sense. He had never been a detective of the showy type. Results had justified his methods. But he was perfectly aware that young Mr. Oakes looked on him as a dull old man who had been miraculously favored by luck. Mr. Snyder had selected Oakes for the case in hand 
principally because it was one where inexperience could do no harm, and where the brilliant guesswork, which Oakes preferred to call his inductive reasoning, might achieve an unexpected success. Another motive actuated Mr. Snyder in his choice. He had a strong suspicion that the conduct of this case was going to have the beneficial result of lowering Oakes' self-esteem. If failure achieved this end, Mr. Snyder felt that failure, though it would not help the agency, would not be an unmixed ill. The door opened and Oakes entered tensely. He did everything tensely, partly from a natural nervous energy and partly as a pose. He was a lean young man, with dark eyes and a thin-lipped mouth, and he looked quite as much like a typical detective as Mr. Snyder looked like a comfortable and prosperous stockbroker. "'Sit down, Oakes,' said Mr. Snyder. "'I've got a job for you.' Oak sank into a chair like a crouching leopard, and placed the tips of his fingers together. He nodded curtly. It was part of his pose to be keen and silent. "'I want you to go to this address,' Mr. Snyder handed him an envelope, "'and look around. The address on that envelope is of a sailor's boarding-house down in Southampton. You know the sort of place. Retired sea captains and so forth live there. All most respectable.' In all its history, nothing more sensational has ever happened than a case of suspected cheating at Halfpenny Knapp. Well, a man had died there. Murdered? Oakes asked. I don't know. That's for you to find out. The coroner left it open. Death by misadventure was the verdict, and I don't blame him. I don't see how it could have been murder. The door was locked on the inside, so nobody could have got in. The window? The window was open, granted, but the room is on the second floor. Anyway, you may dismiss the window. I remember the old lady saying there was a bar across it, and that nobody could have squeezed through." Oakes' eyes glistened. He was interested. "'What was the cause of death?' he asked. Mr. Snyder coughed. "'Snake-bite,' he said. Oakes' careful calm deserted him. He uttered a cry of astonishment. Why, that's incredible! It's the literal truth. The medical examination proved that the fellow had been killed by snake poison, cobra to be exact, which is found principally in India. Cobra! Just so. In a Southampton boarding house, in a room with a locked door, this man was stung by a cobra. To add a little mystification to the limpid simplicity of the affair, when the door was opened there was no sign of any cobra. It couldn't have got out through the door because the door was locked. It couldn't have got out of the window because the window was too high up and snakes can't jump. And it couldn't have gotten up the chimney because there was no chimney. So there you have it." He looked at Oakes with a certain quiet satisfaction. It had come to his ears that Oakes had been heard to complain of the infantile nature and unworthiness of the last two cases to which he had been assigned. He had even said that he hoped some day to be given a problem which should be beyond the reasoning powers of a child of six. It seemed to Mr. Snyder that Oakes was about to get his wish. "'I should like further details,' said Oakes, a little breathlessly. You had better apply to Mrs. Pickett, who owns the boarding-house," Mr. Snyder said. It was she who put the case in my hands. She is convinced that it is murder. But if we exclude ghosts, I don't see how any third party could have taken a hand in the thing at all. However, she wanted a man from this agency, and was prepared to pay for him, so I promised her I would send one. It is not our policy to turn business away." He smiled wryly. In pursuance of that policy, I want you to go and put up at Mrs. Pickett's boarding-house and do your best to enhance the reputation of our agency. I would suggest that you pose as a ship's chandler or something of that sort. You will have to be something maritime or they'll be suspicious of you. And if your visit produces no other results, it will at least enable you to make the acquaintance of a very remarkable woman. I commend Mrs. Pickett to your notice. By the way, she says she will help you in your investigations." Oakes laughed shortly. 
The idea amused him. "'It's a mistake to scoff at amateur assistance, my boy,' said Mr. Snyder, in the benevolently paternal manner which had made a score of criminals refuse to believe him a detective until the moment when the handcuffs snapped on their wrists. Crime investigation isn't an exact science. Success or failure depends in a large measure on applied common sense and the possession of a great deal of special information. Mrs. Pickett knows certain things which neither you nor I know, and it's just possible that she may have some stray piece of information which will provide the key to the entire mystery." Oakes laughed again. "'It is very kind of Mrs. Pickett,' he said, "'but I prefer to trust my own methods.' Oakes rose, his face purposeful. "'I'd better be starting at once,' he said. "'I'll send you reports from time to time.' "'Good. The more detail the better,' said Mr. Snyder genially. "'I hope your visit to the Excelsior will be pleasant. And cultivate Mrs. Pickett. She's worth while.' The door closed, and Mr. Snyder lighted a fresh cigar. "'Dash it, young fool!' he murmured, as he turned his mind to other matters. 3. A day later Mr. Snyder sat in his office reading a typewritten report. It appeared to be of a humorous nature, for, as he read, chuckles escaped him. Finishing the last sheet, he threw his head back and laughed heartily. The manuscript had not been intended by its author for a humorous effort. What Mr. Snyder had been reading was the first of Elliot Oak's reports from the Excelsior. It read as follows. I am sorry to be unable to report any real progress. I have formed several theories which I will put forward later, but at present I cannot say that I am hopeful. Directly I arrived here I sought out Mrs. Pickett, explained who I was, and requested her to furnish me with any further information which might be of service to me. She is a strange, silent woman, who impressed me as having very little intelligence. Your suggestion that I should avail myself of her assistance seems more curious than ever, now that I have seen her. The whole affair seems to me at the moment of writing quite inexplicable. Assuming that this Captain Gunner was murdered, there appears to have been no motive for the crime whatsoever. I have made careful inquiries about him, and found that he was a man of fifty-five, had spent nearly forty years of his life at sea, the last dozen in command of his own ship, was of a somewhat overbearing disposition, though with a fund of rough humour, had travelled all over the world, and had been an inmate of the Excelsior for about ten months. He had a small annuity and no other money at all, which disposes of money as the motive for the crime. In my character of James Burton, a retired ship's chandler, I have mixed with the other boarders, and have heard all they have to say about the affair. I gather that the deceased was by no means popular. He appears to have had a bitter tongue, and I have not met one man who seems to regret his death. On the other hand, I have heard nothing which would suggest that he had any active and violent enemies. He was simply the unpopular boarder. There is always one in every boarding-house, but nothing more. I have seen a good deal of the man who shared his room, another sea captain named Muller. He is a big, silent person, and it is not easy to get him to talk. As regards the death of Captain Gunner, he can tell me nothing. It seems that on the night of the tragedy he was away at Portsmouth with some friends. All I have got from him is some information as to Captain Gunner's habits which leads nowhere. The dead man seldom drank, except at night, when he would take some whiskey. His head was not strong, and a little of the spirit was enough to make him semi-intoxicated, when he would be hilarious and often insulting. I gather that Muller found him a difficult roommate. But he is one of those placid persons who can put up with anything. He and Gunner were in the habit of playing draughts together every night in their room, and Gunner had a harmonica which he played frequently. Apparently he was playing it very soon before he died, which is significant as seeming to dispose of the idea of suicide. As I say, I have one or two theories, but they are in a very nebulous state. The most plausible is that on one of his visits to India—I have ascertained that he had made several voyages there— 
Captain Gunner may in some way have fallen foul of the natives. The fact that he certainly died of the poison of an Indian snake supports this theory. I am making inquiries as to the movements of several Indian sailors who were here in their ships at the time of the tragedy. I have another theory. Does Mrs. Pickett know more about this affair than she appears to? I may be wrong in my estimate of her mental qualities. Her apparent stupidity may be cunning. But here again the absence of motive brings me up against a dead wall. I must confess that at present I do not see my way clearly. However, I will write again shortly." Mr. Snyder derived the utmost enjoyment from the report. He liked the substance of it, and above all, he was tickled by the bitter tone of frustration which characterized it. Oakes was baffled, and his knowledge of Oakes told him that the sensation of being baffled was gall and wormwood to that high-spirited young man. Whatever might be the result of this investigation, it would teach him the virtue of patience. He wrote his assistants a short note. Dear Oakes, your report received. You certainly seem to have got the hard case which I hear you were pining for. Don't build too much on plausible motives in a case of this sort. Fauntleroy, the London murderer, killed a woman for no other reason than that she had thick ankles. Many years ago I myself was on a case where a man murdered an intimate friend because of a dispute about a bet. My experience is that five murderers out of ten act on the whim of the moment, without anything which, properly speaking, you could call a motive at all. Yours very cordially, Paul Snyder. P.S. I don't think much of your picket theory. However, you're in charge. I wish you luck. 4. Young Mr. Oakes was not enjoying himself. For the first time in his life the self-confidence which characterized all his actions seemed to be failing him. The change had taken place almost overnight. The fact that the case had the appearance of presenting the unusual had merely stimulated him at first, but then doubts had crept in and the problem had begun to appear insoluble. True, he had only just taken it up, but something told him that for all the progress he was likely to make he might just as well have been working on it steadily for a month. He was completely baffled, and every moment which he spent in the Excelsior boarding-house made it clear to him that that infernal old woman with the pale eyes thought him an incompetent fool. It was that, more than anything, which made him acutely conscious of his lack of success. His nerves were being sorely troubled by the quiet scorn of Mrs. Pickett's gaze. He began to think that perhaps he had been a shade too self-confident and abrupt in the short interview which he had had with her on his arrival. As might have been expected, his first act, after his brief interview with Mrs. Pickett, was to examine the room where the tragedy had taken place. The body was gone, but otherwise nothing had been moved. Oakes belonged to the magnifying-glass school of detection. The first thing he did on entering the room was to make a careful examination of the floor, the walls, the furniture, and the window-sill. He would have hotly denied the assertion that he did this because it looked well, but he would have been hard put to it to advance any other reason. If he discovered anything, his discoveries were entirely negative, and served only to deepen the mystery of the case. As Mrs. Snyder had said, there was no chimney, and nobody could have entered through the locked door. There remained the window. It was small, and apprehensiveness, perhaps, of the possibility of burglars, had caused the proprietress to make it doubly secure with an iron bar. No human being could have squeezed his way through it. It was late that night that he wrote and dispatched to headquarters the report which had amused Mr. Snyder. 5. Two days later Mr. Snyder sat at his desk, staring with wide, unbelieving eyes at a telegram he had just received. It read as follows. I have solved Gunner Mystery. Returning. Oakes. Mr. Snyder narrowed his eyes and rang the bell. Send Mr. Oakes to me directly he arrives, he said. He was pained to find that his chief emotion was one of bitter annoyance. 
The swift solution of such an apparently insoluble problem would reflect the highest credit on the agency. And there were picturesque circumstances connected with the case which would make it popular with the newspapers and lead to its being given a great deal of publicity. Yet, in spite of all this, Mr. Snyder was annoyed. He realized now how large a part the desire to reduce Oak's self-esteem had played with him. He further realized, looking at the thing honestly, that he had been firmly convinced that the young man would not come within a mile of reasonable solution of the mystery. He had desired only that his failure would prove a valuable educational experience for him. For he believed that failure, at this particular point in his career, would make Oakes a more valuable asset to the agency. But now here Oakes was, within a ridiculously short space of time, returning to the fold, not humble and defeated, but triumphant. Mr. Snyder looked forward with apprehension to the young man's probable demeanor under the intoxicating influence of victory. His apprehensions were well grounded. He had barely finished the third of a series of cigars, which, like milestones, marked the progress of his afternoon, when the door opened and young Oakes entered. Mr. Snyder could not repress a faint moan at the sight of him. One glance was enough to tell him that his worst fears were realized. "'I got your telegram,' said Mr. Snyder. Oakes nodded. "'It surprised you, eh?' he asked. Mr. Snyder resented the patronizing tone of the question, but he had resigned himself to be patronized and keep his anger in check. "'Yes,' he replied. "'I must say it did surprise me. I didn't gather from your report that you had even found a clue. Was it the Indian theory that turned the trick?' Oakes laughed tolerantly. "'Oh, I never really believed that preposterous theory for one moment. I just put it in to round out my report. I hadn't begun to think about the case then, not really think.' Mr. Snyder, nearly exploding with wrath, extended his cigar case. "'Light up and tell me all about it,' he said, controlling his anger. "'Well, I won't say I haven't earned this,' said Oakes, puffing away. He let the ash of his cigar fall delicately to the floor, another action which seemed significant to his employer. As a rule, his assistants, unless particularly pleased with themselves, used the ashtray. My first act on arriving, Oak said, was to have a talk with Mrs. Pickett, a very dull old woman. Curious, she struck me as rather intelligent. Not on your life. She gave me no assistance whatever. I then examined the room where the death had taken place. It was exactly as you described it. There was no chimney. The door had been locked on the inside. The one window was very high up. At first sight, it looked extremely unpromising. Then I had a chat with some of the other boarders. They had nothing of any importance to contribute. Most of them simply gibbered. I then gave up trying to get help from the outside, and resolved to rely on my own intelligence." He smiled triumphantly. "'It is a theory of mine, Mr. Snyder, which I have found valuable, that in nine cases out of ten, Remarkable things don't happen. I don't quite follow you there, Mr. Snyder interrupted. I will put it another way, if you like. What I mean is that the simplest explanation is nearly always the right one. Consider this case. It seemed impossible that there should have been any reasonable explanation of the man's death. Most men would have worn themselves out guessing at wild theories. If I had started to do that, I should have been guessing now. As it is, here I am. I trusted to my belief that nothing remarkable ever happens, and I won out." Mr. Snyder sighed softly. Oakes was entitled to a certain amount of gloating, but there could be no doubt that his way of telling a story was downright infuriating. "'I believe in the logical sequence of events. I refuse to accept effects unless they are preceded by causes. In other words, with all due respect to your possibly contrary opinions, Mr. Snyder, I simply decline to believe in a murder unless there is a motive for it. The first thing I set myself to ascertain was 
what was the motive for the murder of Captain Gunner, and after thinking it over and making every possible inquiry, I decided that there was no motive. Therefore, there was no murder. Mr. Snyder's mouth opened, and he obviously was about to protest. But he appeared to think better of it, and Oakes proceeded. I then tested the suicide theory. What motive was there for suicide? There was no motive, therefore there was no suicide. This time Mr. Snyder spoke. You haven't been spending the last few days in the wrong house by any chance, have you? You'll be telling me next that there wasn't any dead man. Oak smiled. Not at all. Captain John Gunner was dead all right. As the medical evidence proved, he died of the bite of a cobra. It was a small cobra which came from Java. Mr. Snyder stared at him. How do you know? I do know, beyond any possibility of doubt. Did you see the snake? Oak shook his head. Then how in heaven's name? I have enough evidence to make a jury convict Mr. Snake without leaving the box. Then suppose you tell me this. How did your cobra from Java get out of the room? By the window, replied Oakes impassively. How can you possibly explain that? You say yourself that the window was high up. Nevertheless, it got out by the window. The logical sequence of events is proof enough that it was in the room. It killed Captain Gunner there, and left traces of its presence outside. Therefore, as the window was the only exit, it must have escaped by that route. It may have climbed, or it may have jumped, but somehow it got out of that window. What do you mean, it left traces of its presence outside? It killed a dog in the back yard behind the house, Oak said. The window of Captain Gunner's room projects out over it. It is full of boxes and litter, and there are a few stunted shrubs scattered about. In fact, there is enough cover to hide any small object like the body of a dog. That's why it was not discovered at first. The maid at the Excelsior came on it the morning after I sent you my report while she was emptying a box of ashes in the yard. It was just an ordinary stray dog, without collar or license. The analyst examined the body and found that the dog had died of the bite of a cobra. But you didn't find the snake? No. We cleaned out that yard till you could have eaten your breakfast there, but the snake was gone. It must have escaped through the door of the yard which was standing ajar. That was a couple of days ago, and there has been no further tragedy. In all likelihood, it is dead. The nights are pretty cold now, and it would probably have died of exposure. But I just don't understand how a cobra got to Southampton, said the amazed Mr. Snyder. Can't you guess it? I told you it came from Java. How did you know it did? Captain Muller told me. Not directly, but I pieced it together from what he said. It seems that an old shipmate of Captain Gunner's was living in Java. They corresponded, and occasionally this man would send the captain a present as a mark of his esteem. The last present he sent was a crate of bananas. Unfortunately, the snake must have got in unnoticed. That's why I told you the cobra was a small one. Well, that's my case against Mr. Snake, and short of catching him with the goods, I don't see how I could have made out a stronger one. Don't you agree?" It went against the grain for Mr. Snyder to acknowledge defeat. But he was a fair-minded man, and he was forced to admit that Oakes did certainly seem to have solved the impossible. "'I congratulate you, my boy,' he said as heartily as he could. "'To be completely frank, when you started out, I didn't think you could do it. By the way, I suppose Mrs. Pickett was pleased?' "'If she was, she didn't show it. I'm pretty well convinced that she hasn't enough sense to be pleased at anything.' However, she has invited me to dinner with her tonight. I imagine she'll be as boring as usual, but she made such a point of it I had to accept. 6. For some time after Oakes had gone, Mr. Snyder sat smoking and thinking in embittered meditation. Suddenly there was brought the card of Mrs. Pickett, who would be grateful if he could spare her a few moments. Mr. Snyder was glad to see Mrs. Pickett. He was a student of character, 
and she had interested him at their first meeting. There was something about her which had seemed to him unique, and he welcomed this second chance of studying her at close range. She came in and sat down stiffly, balancing herself on the extreme edge of the chair in which a short while before young Oakes had lounged so luxuriously. "'How are you, Mrs. Pickett?' said Mr. Snyder, genially. I'm very glad that you could find time to pay me a visit. Well, so it wasn't murder after all. Sir? I've just been talking to Mr. Oakes, whom you met as James Burton, said the detective. He has told me all about it. He told me all about it, said Mrs. Pickett dryly. Mr. Snyder looked at her inquiringly. Her manner seemed more suggestive than her words. A conceited, headstrong young fool said Mrs. Pickett. It was no new picture of his assistant that she had drawn. Mr. Snyder had often drawn it himself, but at the present juncture it surprised him. Oakes, in his hour of triumph, surely did not deserve this sweeping condemnation. Did not Mr. Oakes' solution of the mystery satisfy you, Mrs. Pickett? No. It struck me as logical and convincing, Mr. Snyder said. You may call it all the fancy names you please, Mr. Snyder, but Mr. Oak's solution was not the right one. Have you an alternative to offer? Mrs. Pickett tightened her lips. If you have, I should like to hear it. You will, at the proper time. What makes you so certain that Mr. Oakes is wrong? He starts out with an impossible explanation and rests his whole case on it. There couldn't have been a snake in that room because it couldn't have gotten out. The window was too high. But surely the evidence of the dead dog. Mrs. Pickett looked at him as if he had disappointed her. I had always heard you spoken of as a man with common sense, Mr. Snyder. I have always tried to use common sense. Then why are you trying now to make yourself believe that something happened which could not possibly have happened just because it fits in with something which isn't easy to explain? You mean there is another explanation of the dead dog? Mr. Snyder asked. Not another. What Mr. Oakes takes for granted is not an explanation. But there is a common-sense explanation, and if he had not been so headstrong and conceited, he might have found it. You speak as if you had found it, chided Mr. Snyder. I have. Mrs. Pickett leaned forward as she spoke, and stared at him defiantly. Mr. Snyder started. You have? Yes. What is it? You will know before tomorrow. In the meantime, try and think it out for yourself. A successful and prosperous detective agency like yours, Mr. Snyder, ought to do something in return for a fee. There was something in her manner so reminiscent of the schoolteacher reprimanding a recalcitrant pupil that Mr. Snyder's sense of humor came to his rescue. "'We do our best, Mrs. Pickett,' he said, "'but you mustn't forget that we are only human and cannot guarantee results.' Mrs. Pickett did not pursue the subject. Instead, she proceeded to astonish Mr. Snyder by asking him to swear out a warrant for the arrest of a man known to them both on a charge of murder. Mr. Snyder's breath was not often taken away in his own office. As a rule, he received his client's communications calmly, strange as they often were. But at her words, he gasped. The thought crossed his mind that Mrs. Pickett might well be mentally unbalanced. The details of the case were fresh in his memory, and he distinctly recollected that the person she mentioned had been away from the boarding-house on the night of Captain Gunner's death, and could, he imagined, produce witnesses to prove it. Mrs. Pickett was regarding him with an unfaltering stare. To all outward appearances she was the opposite of unbalanced. "'But you can't swear out a warrant without evidence,' he told her. "'I have evidence.' she replied firmly. "'Precisely what kind of evidence?' he demanded. "'If I told you now, you would think that I was out of my mind.' "'But, Mrs. Pickett, do you realize what you are asking me to do?' 
I cannot make this agency responsible for the arbitrary arrest of a man on the strength of a single individual's suspicions. It might ruin me. At the least it would make me a laughing-stock. Mr. Snyder, you may use your own judgment whether or not to make the arrest on that warrant. You will listen to what I have to say, and you will see for yourself how the crime was committed. If, after that, you feel you cannot make the arrest, I will accept your decision. I know who killed Captain Gunner, she said. I knew it from the beginning. It was like a vision, but I had no proof. Now things have come to light, and everything is clear. Against his judgment, Mr. Snyder was impressed. This woman had the magnetism which makes for persuasiveness. It, it sounds incredible. Even as he spoke, he remembered that it had long been a professional maxim of his that nothing was incredible, and he weakened still further. Mr. Snyder, I ask you to swear out that warrant. The detective gave in. Very well, he said. Mrs. Pickett rose. If you will come and dine at my house tonight, I think I can prove to you that it will be needed. Will you come? I'll come, promised Mr. Snyder. 7. When Mr. Snyder arrived at the Excelsior, and shortly after he was shown into the little private sitting-room where he found Oakes, the third guest of the evening unexpectedly arrived. Mr. Snyder looked curiously at the newcomer. Captain Muller had a peculiar fascination for him. It was not Mr. Snyder's habit to trust overmuch to appearances. But he could not help admitting that there was something about this man's aspect which brought Mrs. Pickett's charges out of the realm of the fantastic into that of the possible. There was something odd, an unnatural aspect of gloom about the man. He bore himself like one carrying a heavy burden. His eyes were dull, his face haggard. The next moment the detective was reproaching himself with allowing his imagination to run away with his calmer judgment. The door opened and Mrs. Pickett came in. She made no apology for her lateness. To Mr. Snyder one of the most remarkable points about the dinner was the peculiar metamorphosis of Mrs. Pickett from the brooding silent woman he had known to the gracious and considerate hostess. Oakes appeared also to be overcome with surprise, so much so that he was unable to keep his astonishment to himself. He had come prepared to endure a dull evening absorbed in grim silence, and he found himself instead opposite a bottle of champagne of a brand and ear which commanded his utmost respect. What was even more incredible, his hostess had transformed herself into a pleasant old lady whose only aim seemed to be to make him feel at home. Beside each of the guests' plates was a neat paper parcel. Oakes picked his up and stared at it in wonderment. "'Why, this is more than a party souvenir, Mrs. Pickett,' he said. "'It's the kind of mechanical marvel I've always wanted to have on my desk.' "'I'm glad you like it, Mr. Oakes,' Mrs. Pickett said, smiling. You must not think of me simply as a tired old woman whom age has completely defeated. I am an ambitious hostess. When I give these little parties, I like to make them a success. I want each of you to remember this dinner. I'm sure I will. Mrs. Pickett smiled again. I think you all will. You, Mr. Snyder, she paused, and you, Captain Muller. To Mr. Snyder there was so much meaning in her voice as she said this that he was amazed that it conveyed no warning to Muller. Captain Muller, however, was already drinking heavily. He looked up when addressed and uttered a sound which might have been taken for an expression of polite acquiescence. Then he filled his glass again. Mr. Snyder's parcel revealed a watch-charm fashioned in the shape of a tiny, candid-eye camera. That, said Mrs. Pickett, is a compliment to your profession." She leaned toward the captain. "'Mr. Snyder is a detective, Captain Muller.' He looked up. It seemed to Mr. Snyder that a look of fear lit up his heavy eyes for an instant. It came and went, if indeed it came at all, so swiftly that he could not be certain. "'So?' said Captain Muller. He spoke quite evenly. 
with just the amount of interest which such an announcement would naturally produce. "'Now for yours, Captain,' said Oakes. "'I guess it's something special. It's twice the size of mine, anyway.' It may have been something in the old woman's expression as she watched Captain Muller slowly tearing the paper that sent a thrill of excitement through Mr. Snyder. Something seemed to warn him of the approach of a psychological moment. He bent forward eagerly. There was a strangled gasp, a thump, and onto the table from the captain's hands there fell a little harmonica. There was no mistaking the look on Muller's face now. His cheeks were like wax and his eyes, so dull till then, blazed with a panic and horror which he could not repress. The glasses on the table rocked as he clutched at the cloth. Mrs. Pickett spoke. "'Why, Captain Muller, has it upset you? I thought that, as his best friend, the man who shared his room, you would value a memento of Captain Gunner. How fond you must have been of him for the sight of his harmonica to be such a shock!' The captain did not speak. He was staring, fascinated at the thing on the table. Mrs. Pickett turned to Mr. Snyder. Her eyes, as they met his, held him entranced. "'Mr. Snyder, as a detective you will be interested in a curious and very tragic affair which happened in this house a few days ago. One of my boarders, Captain Gunner, was found dead in his room. It was the room which he shared with Captain Muller. I am very proud of the reputation of my house, Mr. Snyder, and it was a blow to me that this should have happened. I applied to an agency for a detective, and they sent me a stupid boy, with nothing to recommend him except his belief in himself. He said that Captain Gunner had died by accident, killed by a snake which had come out of a crate of bananas. I knew better. I knew that Captain Gunner had been murdered. Are you listening, Captain Muller? This will interest you, as you were such a friend of his. The captain did not answer. He was staring straight before him, as if he saw something invisible in eyes forever closed in death. Yesterday we found the body of a dog. It had been killed, as Captain Gunner had been, by the poison of a snake. The boy from the agency said that this was conclusive. He said that the snake had escaped from the room after killing Captain Gunner, and had in turn killed the dog. I knew that to be impossible, for if there had been a snake in that room, it could not have made its escape. Her eyes flashed and became remorselessly accusing. It was not a snake that killed Captain Gunner. It was a cat. Captain Gunner had a friend who hated him. One day, in opening a crate of bananas, this friend found a snake. He killed it and extracted the poison. He knew Captain Gunner's habits. He knew that he played a harmonica. This man also had a cat. He knew that cats hated the sound of a harmonica. He had often seen this particular cat fly at Captain Gunner and scratch him when he played. He took the cat and covered its claws with the poison, and then he left it in the room with Captain Gunner. He knew what would happen. Oakes and Mr. Snyder were on their feet. Captain Muller had not moved. He sat there, his fingers gripping the cloth. Mrs. Pickett rose and went to a closet. She unlocked the door. "'Kitty!' she called. "'Kitty, kitty!' A black cat ran swiftly out into the room. With a clatter and a crash of crockery and a ringing of glass the table heaved, rocked and overturned as Muller staggered to his feet. He threw up his hands as if to ward something off. A choking cry came from his lips. "'Gut! Gut!' Mrs. Pickett's voice rang through the room, cold and biting. "'Captain Muller, you murdered Captain Gunner!' The captain shuddered. Then, mechanically, he replied. "'Got. Yes, I killed him.' "'You heard, Mr. Snyder,' said Mrs. Pickett. "'He has confessed before witnesses. Take him away.' Muller allowed himself to be moved toward the door. His arm in Mr. Snyder's grip felt limp. Mrs. Pickett stopped and took something from the debris on the floor. She rose, holding the harmonica. 
You are forgetting your souvenir, Captain Muller, she said. The End of Death at the Excelsior by P. G. Woodhouse